This is a 2021 Mercedes-Benz GLS 450 4Matic. And this video is about my experience of living with this car for the past three months. I ordered this car in May of 2021 and I had the car delivered to me in November of 2021. Everything took a while in 2021 because of chip shortage and that is still ongoing. I have come to uh, experience certain things about the car that I like quite a bit and certain things which I think can be improved. So this video is, is about the experience I've had with this and my uh, and my recommendation and my thoughts for anyone who is looking to purchase this vehicle. There have been no substantial changes to the 2022 model year. So this video will largely apply to the 2022 model year GLS 450 as well. Here's a quick spec sheet on the on the vehicle here's my window sticker as you can see it's pretty well optioned uh, this is a selenite gray metallic um, with macchiato beige interior and the natural grain walnut trim the options on the vehicle apologies for the light the options on the vehicle are the air ionization the load sill guard the mbtex wrapped lower dashboard and the and the doors the power second row sunshades heated and cooled front cup holders multi-contour front seats with massage panorama sunroof heated steering wheel heads up display uh, trailer hitch five zone climate control which is very interesting just given if you don't order that feature you don't get climate vents in the third row for a vehicle of this size yeah very annoying illuminated running boards magic vision control uh, that's a great feature to have uh, for uh, uh, the uh, the windshield washer fluid comes out from these laser cut holes in the in the wiper blade and that keeps the windshield really clean when you need it soft closed doors and uh, in terms of the assistance packages I have the driver assistance package and the warmth and comfort package uh, on the vehicle uh, the the MSRP on the vehicle was ninety thousand nine hundred eighty five dollars, and uh, you know and the EPA mileage on the car is twenty one. I have been averaging about eighteen miles to a gallon in about three thousand miles that I've done with the with the vehicle. Okay, so let's get on with the let's get on with the vehicle. Now, as you can see, the car has these two giant screens in front of you. Um, very crisp, no issues in seeing the contents of the screen in uh, in a very sunny day. Even with the, even if I open up the panoramic sunroof, no issues in, with any glare on the screen. So very well, uh, job well done from the uh, by Mercedes. Now what I can't capture on this, and here the Hey Mercedes came on. Um, what I can't capture with the, for you properly on this, uh, on uh, oh maybe you maybe you can see it from here. Okay, so I think the screens are great. My only complaints with the screen is the camera right now is at my uh, is at my eye level, and as you can see, a portion of the of the um, um, the speedometer or the left side gauge gets cut off now if you tilt you'll see it but i think the screens are just a little bit too large to fit inside the spokes of the wheel now the same issue if you look on the right side you see this part of the screen that gets cut off now if i if i bend slightly towards the right you'll see it and where this is particularly annoying is if you turn on the navigation as you can see there's a portion of the screen that's always that always seems to remain uh remain cut off um not a huge not not the most annoying thing the car does have a pretty spiffy uh, heads up display but i just think in terms of ergonomics this is something mercedes could have done a better job in their usability testing and look the answer sh maybe could have been you can't really expand the wheel as much but the answer could have been to shrink the screen a bit so it doesn't get cut off when uh, when people are viewing it now i have tried adjusting the height of my seat uh, quite a bit. I have tried adjusting the the height of the steering wheel. It doesn't help. So that's the annoying part. Um, but the screens itself are fantastic. I've had no issues 
with this infotainment system in terms of crashing. As I said, I've had it for about three months and it, it boots pretty quickly. Um, no lag whatsoever. Here, I'll show you, uh, you know, the way to navigate, you know, this, this infotainment system. It's been pretty well covered in all the other reviews. So I won't waste time on showing, all, showing you all the detailed features, but you can control it using some of these shortcuts that are on the right side of the steering wheel that controls the right screen uh, and this screen, the center screen you uh, th this driver uh, screen can be controlled with the shortcuts and this little um, uh, this little blackberry style uh, wheel on the left side of the steering wheel now if you come back to the screen as i was saying you know no issues with uh, uh, with the speed you can go back to the home using this thing on the touch uh, on the touch controller or you can go to home using this button here or you can press on home on the screen i just because of i like this the the wrist feature the wrist pad feature on the in the car so i ended up resting my my hands here quite a bit and using this feature uh, using this shortcut so if i press this you go back to the home screen and as you can see, like you can, you know, you can navigate pretty easily. I I think the overall usability of the system. How do I rank it? Now my, I'm coming from my prior car was a Volvo XC90 2018. Before that, I had a 2015 BMW M5, um, and a few other BMWs prior to that. I've also uh, owned an Acura MDX, and I also own this little Fiat 500 that's parked to the side. I think this is a this is a system that takes a little bit of getting used to. Um, there are a lot of menus as you will look on the screen. If you uh, if you look at the screen, you have the main settings, and then you have sub menus underneath it. It's pretty easy to pick up once you get the hang of it. But I, you know, I I, I certainly had to spend uh, a couple of days getting familiar with it. But now I understand where most things are. Uh, you can also, uh, there are lots of menus and sub-menus, uh, but Mercedes does provide this favorites or this little, you know, star button here through which you can save your shortcuts. So if I press here, it goes into the favorites menu and I have some favorites uh, configured here. Um, you know, massage, seat, seat kinetics, ambient lighting, user profiles, etc., etc. And that's completely up to you. You can add a few more of these uh by creating your favorite and that certainly makes it very handy um what else on the screen um i think the nav on the system the the integrated nav that uh that the car comes with is okay uh it's very crisp most times the nav works just fine However, the issue with this nav is, and I still haven't been able to figure it out. So if somebody has, please post that in the comments. Uh, sometimes it doesn't zoom in appropriately when you're coming up on a turn. The view remains, uh, you know, quite high level. And that creates a little bit of an issue where if you are at a tricky um, junction on the highway, you may miss the turn because the you know the the gps the, the car's gps may not you know actually say that hey stay on the left side of the of the road because that's where that's where you need to be um and you can you end up missing the turns uh you know i, I end up i've ended up missing the turns a few times because of that it's pretty crisp it works 95 percent of the time uh however i do find myself going uh to gra uh, go going to plug in my apple carplay on this vehicle and that's that's one gripe. So the car itself has has a wireless charge pad here. This works well most of the this works well I would say half the time. If I were to put my phone here and I'll show you what I mean by that. Here's my my iPhone 13 Pro. Not the Max, just the regular Pro. I put the phone here. It should show a message right here, wireless charging started. When I'm driving the car, every few seconds, 
see right here now it says wireless charging not possible every few seconds the charging will start automatically and then it'll stop automatically and for the life of me I have not been able to figure out what the matter is I've also tried doing this with uh, I have a iPhone 11 uh, I also have an Android uh, Samsung Galaxy flip 3 phone I've tried this with a lot of phones and for some reason the charge pad is not able to charge continuously and uh, at the end of the day I, 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 I just can't rely on it now going back to the issue of Google Maps so you've got the wireless charge pad here now look you would expect that if you got wireless charging you also have wireless Apple CarPlay or wireless Android not the case right there wireless charging not possible not the case you have to plug this phone in through a wire into the car now that's just really bad design if you're offering wireless charging why would you not have wireless Apple CarPlay I understand maybe it's a older hardware but certainly something Mercedes should fix now in model year 22 uh, that is still not offered right now and, and I haven't heard any plans from from Mercedes and upgrading this to a wireless charging system the annoying part of using the wired piece here's the wire it takes a USB it takes a USB C uh, oh, wrong end the car only has USB C ports so this one and the only data port through which you can do Apple car charging uh, Apple CarPlay is this port over here there are two ports it's this guy here okay you plug this in obviously there's no point uh, there's no point in wireless car charging because it it doesn't work most of the time I I plug this in Apple CarPlay will will come on as you can see on the screen okay there you go now it's a beautiful large screen but for some reason Apple CarPlay only fits in a portion of the screen you have a lot of empty space on either side uh, there's certainly a lot of widescreen applications of Apple CarPlay in various vehicles Mercedes has chosen not to do it and frankly it doesn't look very nice when you're running this small scale Apple, Car Apple CarPlay on the screen so that's one issue but I think the bigger issue is once you plug this cable in and you have your phone what do you do where do you where do you keep this phone you keep this in the cup holder do you put this here if you put this here well as you can see it's it makes for a pretty tight fit um, yeah you can argue that you can use a, a, a smaller uh, cable and close it um, but it's it's a pretty tight fit a much better implementation of this would have been if the USB-C port here inside was data compatible so you could you know plug in your phone and just leave it here uh, but no that's the only data port on the car so I find this quite annoying and if you have if you have a Pro Max or any of the larger phones this will not fit and you certainly won't be able to put your phone there in the wireless pad and plug in the Apple CarPlay um, well, right there wireless charging started but as you'll see it'll go away pretty quickly as well all right so let's get out of that the materials are great the the walnut finish in, on this uh, on the trim is beautiful the vents are pretty nicely laid out I like those um, these vents this is a fake vent at the top a real vent at the bottom um, for, you know, I think this may be a cost-saving measure they have a fake vent here it doesn't it's not actually a vent and then you've got the then you've got the vents there uh, the other thing about the screens I would say are the Blackberry controllers are sometimes very touch sensitive so it certainly took me a few tries to get the hang of it I haven't found out how to make them less sensitive um, 
you know, and, and uh, if somebody has that, sh somebody knows how to do that in the infotainment system, please do let me know. Uh, what are any uh, some of the other quirk quirks of the car? There's a lot of information being displayed displayed here on the screen, but there's one thing which is not, and that is how many miles are on this car? What's the odometer? The only way I have found out to actually see my odometer is if I if I go to my info screen okay that's a fancy graphic Hang on, I think it's through here. So I go to favorites, I go to themes, and I believe I press on this one. So it changes the theme a bit, and now I can see my odometer. It, 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 it the theme I like to be in is the is the trip and in that theme the 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 the, uh, uh, the odometer goes away now the reason I like this trip theme is if I had my GPS set in the center screen it would be giving me the direction the arrow directions of what the next um, guidance point is or I could see the map here if I don't want to show the map on the screen you know so that's convenient but there's no place to actually see the odometer there's a whole bunch of other information your you know your range your um, uh, your fuel uh, fuel tank information your driver assist uh, your lane assist, your gears, and then on the right side, uh, this is on the right side, you can have your formatic display, uh, your suspension height, your tachometer, oil, your consumption, just some useless gauge which I never use, the map, your G-force, which this is a family SUV, not sure how relevant or useful this this gauge is and then this is a really useful one on the highway it shows what the car is seeing in front of you so when I have the um, when I have the uh, I call it autopilot I'm sure Mercedes uses a different different terminology but it's the auto steer the auto brake auto lane change on this car uh, this shows me the distance to the front car and if the car is able to see the the uh, the lane markers on the side meaning the car can cent keep itself centered so if these lines are green it tells you that the car is centered uh, this will also light up and if and you will you, if you're following a car it'll show the car in the front it'll tell you how much distance you have to that car so it's quite it's quite handy but going back to it, I would really like to see an odometer and not have to go through, you know, a few clicks of the favorite and change the theme to be able to see it. Something for Mercedes to fix in in uh, uh, in, in its uh, future uh, iterations. Now, this is the first, well, this is the first modern Mercedes I, I, uh, I bought. I also have a 1986 190E. What's, what took me a while to figure out or get used to is this stock which does a lot of things this is uh, this controls your your windshield washers both the front and the back it controls your uh, your your indicators and then it also controls your high beam now that's a lot of function for one stock and in a very typical Mercedes fashion, it is, I believe, overly 
complicated. Uh, although I get why they did, they didn't want to add a second stock here to have two hanging out, so they loaded a bunch of functions on this one stock. Um, but in my in the Volvos, the the BMWs and the Acuras I've had, and obviously this this little Fiat, uh, not the case. And and uh, you know, oftentimes you have the Viper functionality on the right side, but in this car you have the uh, that's your uh, your gear mechanism. So. Uh, makes sense, but it does take a little bit of getting used to. I am still uh, not sure on. Uh, okay, so I, I think I, I got it. If you press the stock down, you turn on the auto high beam function, and you know you've turned it on is when you press it down. Follow, look at the bottom right of the screen. There you go. That little icon showed up, so that tells you auto high beam is on. And if you pull the stock up, you will use your dipper. So that's the high beam. The This is right now set on the auto uh, viper setting. And these two buttons control the re rear vipers. This is if you want to clean it, the rear, uh, the rear window. And this is if you just want to run the rear, uh, the rear viper. Okay. Uh, what else so to me it was a little bit of a shocker that a car at this price point does not come with leather as standard on the dashboard and the um and the uh uh sorry it doesn't come as standard on the lower dash and the upper door trim if you don't option for the package that i showed to you this would all be plastic, and that's a little bit of a shame in Mercedes to, to not offer it. Uh, the other, I would say, the bummer in the car or opportunity for Mercedes to fix it is these rear door pockets. The front, uh, both the fronts and the backs uh, are not felt lined. So over the past few days, I was, not, I was noticing a creak, and I was getting really worried that there's a creak coming from the car, uh, a creaking sound. It turned out my son had left a plastic water bottle behind the driver's seat in the door in the door bin, and that and any time the car went over a bump or made a turn, the bottle squeaked and that was causing a sound. I think it was felt lined. Uh, it would be a, you know this wouldn't be an issue. So shame, you know, I don't want to say shame in Mercedes, but it kind of boggles my mind that at ninety thousand dollar price point, you don't have felt uh, door linings. I just ordered a 2022 Volkswagen GTI, and that's uh, those door uh, door bins are felt lined. Certainly in the M5 and the Volvos, those were felt lined as well, as far as I remember. So not an issue I've encountered before. Um, what else about these cars? Um, the seats are incredibly comfortable. Uh, I I think these are by far. I thought my Volvo seats were amazing. Uh, I had the T6, 2018 T6 inscription, but these seats are way more comfortable than even the Volvo seats, which were also a lot more comfortable than my BMW M5 that I had from 2015 through 18. Uh, but these are definitely the most comfortable seats, and I uh, I've really enjoyed them. It's 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 uh, um, you know no problem sitting in these seats for long journeys. These are heated. Uh, three stage heated and three stage ventil ventilated you can turn them heated and cooling at the same time which is a nice nice feature and you can control the uh, the passenger seat controls by passenger seat controls by pressing this button so now if I press that and as you can see I'm moving the passenger seat from here so that's a nice uh, that's a nice feature and both the driver side and the passenger side comes with three function memory as you can as you can see um this car for some reason the gls 450 does not give you the option of upgrading the sound system i've always had nicer the upgraded sound systems uh in my cars the volvo probably had the best sound system of any uh best stereo of any car i've, I've uh, ever owned uh that was a um, um I believe that's uh, Bowers and Wilk uh, that was Bowers and Wilkins. Yeah, that was Bowers and Wilkins system. Fantastic uh, sound quality. Um, the orchestra 
uh, haul mode was was phenomenal. It was a little bit pricey. I think it was about four thousand dollars in the car when I got it. This car comes with the standard Burmester system, Burmeister system, but there's no option to upgrade this to a higher sound to a higher level um, in GLS 450. In 2021 model year, when GLS 580 was offered, you could upgrade the sound system. I wish that was an option in this car, but uh, it's not. The sound is okay. I think it's a little bit low on the bass. Um, it's as you as you turn up the volume, uh, the sound becomes a bit more richer. But on the lower volumes, um, it's not that impressive. So that's a little bit of a that's a little bit of a letdown. The lighting in the car. I'll, I'll let me turn this off. The uh, this lighting in the car is phenomenal. The kids love it. Uh, there are lots lots of options in here. Um, let me just show you. So when you go into the ambient lighting menu, you can choose multicolor, and then you have. A whole bunch of options here ocean blue purple sky and this is one of the the family favorites and when you choose that the light itself will change colors um, as you can see it's it's becoming a little bit more purple so it, it'll cycle through different colors and that's become uh, a favorite of the of the kids it's a very cool feature you turn the lights on Okay, the panoramic sunroof, it's pretty massive. It goes all the way back. Uh, it's, it's pretty massive and, and uh, um, works very well. Now, in terms of the size of the vehicle, uh, I would say this is 205 inches. Uh, my my XC9, this is about 10 inches longer than the Volvo. Uh, XC90 and you definitely feel the size it's a lot more usable I feel and uh, and in this uh, you know you, you certainly have a lot more room in the third row as well as the storage space behind it which is which is very helpful now that's an X7 that's just getting parked in front of me that's a great car but I think the third row is a little bit small in, in that uh, so I can I am six feet tall and I fit just fine in the third row here I couldn't say that for the XC90 or the Acura MDX that I've sat in before the third rows were not meant for me but here uh, I can go probably a couple of hours in the third row if I had to without any issues so hats off to to Mercedes now the 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 annoying piece is if you don't order the five zone climate control you don't get rear climate vents in the third row, which is uh, which is mind-boggling that for a car this size, why would you not get vents? So you have to get the five-zone climate control to get the vents in the in the third row. Uh, the boot itself is pretty large, uh, significantly l larger than the XC90 with the three rows up. Very useful. I always keep a tennis bag and an accessories bag and and a few other nicks and knacks, and uh, still have plenty of space left in there to do grocery runs etc so no issues there now now this car as i said is 10 inches longer than the xc90 xc90 is a pretty big car but this is 10 inches more than that in terms of driving it's a very easy car to drive the camera system in this car and with all the sensors especially if you get the uh the driver assistance package that i talked about makes it super easy so with this parking assist uh cameras um, you have a lot of different camera views in here. This is the front camera view. I'll put this here. Um, this is another front camera view. And you also get, get the 360 bird's eye view from this. This is a side view from the, uh, from the mirrors. This is a rear camera view. Another rear camera view. And looking down from the rear camera. So... I would say with all these sensors, the cameras that this car has, it's a very, very easy uh, vehicle to drive and park. I park in a, in a car park here, in a condo building, and you can see it's how tight the parking spots are. There's a, there's, that's, that's my 500 park next to me. There's a pillar here, and still no issues getting this car uh, fit in properly 
and very easy to live with. So, um, you know, I think it's a compliment to a car when I say that it drives smaller than it actually feels. I think XC90 was another car where I felt it drew it drove smaller than the actual size of the car, and certainly the case with GLS as well. I think the you know the slight bump on the hood is a little intimidating. If you're coming from an XC90, it's a flattish hood. Here you see the slight bump, and and it feels bigger. But once you settle into the car, I think after a couple of days, it does feel it does feel all right. So no issues there uh, with the vehicle. Um, if you're if you have kids, um, you know as you can see, I have the the this macchiato beige interior. Um, you know it's a light color; it can certainly get dirty. Uh, I would highly recommend getting the Dupont coating on these seats, such that um, you know such that the seats don't pick up the stains from your jeans and from the from the kids. And you know if they spill something in the car. It just won't stick to the seat, so it'll feel, uh, it'll feel, uh, it'll be easy. To, it'll be much easier to clean. In 22 model year, there is the dark brown leather option that's come back on. Uh, I wish that was offered in model year 21 because that's the option I would have taken. Um, you know, one one thing I would say about the interior of this car is that this leather does not feel very nice. Um, you know, M5 had the merino leather. The XC90 T6 inscription had the inscription leather. This feels pretty hard. I'm sure it's a lot more durable than the leather uh, in the Volvo or in the M5, but it doesn't feel very nice. Now, the only Napa leather option in this car or the, the final leather option in this car is offered in the black color, and I don't get black color interiors, so that was a bummer. Um, it's okay. I mean, it's it's not it's not the end of the world, but it doesn't feel as nice the the leather quality as the other cars that I just mentioned. Yeah, I, I the last thing I would say about this car is it really does offer a lot of space um, in this vehicle that I frankly did not did not expect. Um, the 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 second row is absolutely massive. I'll turn on the lights here so you can see. But the second row is absolutely massive here uh, for three people to sit. The third row has enough space for two, three, uh, six feet people to sit there if they if they want to. And there's plenty of luggage room in the back. It's not minivan style luggage, but it's very usable, very handy. Um, now the the uh, in terms of the powertrains on the powertrain on this car this is a GLS 450 so it's a V6 with the EQ boost as Mercedes calls it there's also a V8 option available or will be available for model year 23 Mercedes discontinued GLS 580 for model year 22 but i understand for model year 23 it's it's making a comeback that's a V8 option uh, both V6 and V8s this 450 and 580 uh, our EQ charge, so this mild hybrid system. The mild hybrids are not enough to get the car rolling on its own, but they certainly um, uh, to keep the car going on its own. Uh, but they help in the start-stop uh, feature of these cars, which is which is very handy. Um, the 450 power level, uh, I think it, the way I would describe that is it's just about adequate. The car is turbocharged. Um, you know, I if you if you push this car hard, and this is a big this is a big truck. If you push it hard, I think you know my my feeling is or the, the experience I've had is up till about ninety miles an hour nine zero, it's fine. Above that, it runs out of gas pretty quickly, and you can feel that in the engine that the the speedometer just doesn't budge. Um, you know, the only place I've I've tried that is on the exit ramp, uh, is on the toll booths when you pay when you paid the toll and you're accelerating, the car speeds up very quickly up till about, you know, 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour, maybe even up to 90, and after that it it, it runs out of steam. But in day-to-day -day driving, in normal highway driving, when you're doing 70, 75, 80 miles an hour, this is more than adequate, no issues. It's it's not a it's not a vehicle that you would use to race. 
from stop light to stop light or traffic light to traffic light uh, but as I said for everyday use it's just fine if you do crave uh, even faster ex faster acceleration or um, you know if you are the kind of person who drives in triple digit digits I'm not but if you are that kind of person you may you may want to get the 580 instead of the 450 and wait for a little bit um, Oh, and one, one last thing, and one last one of the last things I would say on the car is the auto hold feature, the auto brake feature on this vehicle. It's a, it works, but it's a little mind-boggling why Mercedes would implement it in that way. So once you come to a complete stop on the road, uh, you would expect that the auto hold just kicks in by its, by itself, but it doesn't you really have to press the brake all the way in for about a second and once you do that then there would be a little signal there would be a little icon that comes up here which says hold and that's when the brake hold is activated i just don't get it if the car is the car suddenly comes to a full stop by pressing this brake pedal halfway in why would the brake hold function not come on half you know by putting the car to a complete stop with the half you know, with the half pedal push why do you have to push it all the way in and really exert a lot of force for the auto hold fe feature to come on uh in the volvo that was not the case and um you know so it, it was it, it felt a lot more natural here it feels a little bit unnatural in the way it's done um <clears throat> one last thing on the one of the last things on the on the on this uh, auto steer auto lane assist feature in the car it works incredibly well i thought the volvo was great but this is a different level uh a you can leave the system on for much longer so hands free of the steering and it's auto steering on the on the uh on the highways for much much longer than the volvo i believe in volvo every 12 or 13 seconds i had to hold the steering or tap the steering here it feels it's almost like two minutes. I haven't clocked it, but it feels much, much longer and, and, and therefore a lot more useful. Also, um, you know, even if you're doing 75, 80 miles an hour on the highway, the car feels absolutely planted in the auto steer mode. I haven't seen it miss a beat in, in you know, if you're going through a curve, if the curve is coming up or, um, or the car in front of you stops or somebody cuts you in, the, the the system is absolutely fantastic so you know kudos to mercedes for designing it in such a way uh, i don't know why somebody would pay twelve thousand dollars for the uh for this for the supposedly self-driving feature in tesla this is great oh and by the way if you're using the the car's navigation and you're coming up an exit ramp on the highway the car will automatically slow down get you into the exit side i haven't I haven't let it take the exit ramp on its own. I'm sure it can. I, uh, I, I take back the control at that point and the car doesn't fight you back. So it works very well. Where the car does fight you is the, it's very aggressive in, uh, in keeping you in the, in the lane. So if, if you don't have the autopilot, auto steering on, autopilot on, whatever you call it, uh, and you, without turning on the indicator, you veer in, try veering into the left lane, the car will very aggressively put you back in the center and if you're not used to that i wasn't the first few times it felt very unnatural and a little bit unnerving that the car was doing it but so, so it fights you pretty hard uh if you try to get into another lane with if you if it thinks you're wearing into another lane so uh but it takes it takes a little bit of getting used to i'm certainly used to that now and and it and it works just fine uh, in conclusion, my overall impressions of this car, um, very happy with it. I think it's a, it's a nice upgrade. The car feels more solid. The car drives, uh, the car drives really well. Um, the powertrain is excellent. The XC90, one downfall in that vehicle was, the engine was just absolute garbage. Uh, it was a highly stressed four cylinder, turbocharged, supercharged, and you felt it, the kind of the sounds it made, you didn't, you know, you, I would rather put earplugs in my ears than listen to the sound coming out of that Volvo engine. This is much nicer. Yes, there's fake sound being pumped into the cabin, but even with the windows down, it just sounds nicer. It feels stronger, it pulls stronger. Um, it feels better, it feels well-made. 
the infotainment system is is great you know some quirks as i uh, some some quirks and annoyances i've said where you know for example if at eye level the screen gets cut off a little bit there is no wireless apple carplay the carplay is not full screen as you can see here it it, it only works on a portion of the screen so there and, and you really have to configure your shortcuts to uh, to make sure you're not going through menus upon menus um, but I think those are things that you can easily get used to, and if once you configure your shortcuts, will will work fine. I do hope Mercedes offers wireless Apple CarPlay and um, in the near future on this vehicle. Uh, the space is great. The fuel economy on this it's a much larger vehicle than XC90. Uh, I'm averaging about 18 miles to a gallon on the highway. Uh, I've done about 3,000 miles on the car. Uh, it's about 18 miles overall 18 miles to a gallon overall on the highway i i can get into the 22s and 23s in the three years i had the volvo uh when i i never reset the the fuel consumption or the odometer reading on it so from the day i got the volvo to the last day i turned my my car in uh, i averaged just under 17 miles to a gallon that was a much smaller engine so there you go. A bigger engine can actually give you better performance and better better fuel mileage. So very happy with that overall. Very happy with the vehicle overall. Um, and again, if you uh, if you are, it is a bit on the pricier side. The X7 that's parked in front of me, you know, that's about five, six, seven thousand dollars lower in cost than the than the Mercedes. Uh, it it also has a little bit of a nicer interior in terms of the options available for the leather. Uh, but I think in terms of the practicality, this is a lot more practical car with the space you have in the third row and the space you have behind the third row. Um, so overall, very happy with the car. Hopefully you found this uh, living with the vehicle review helpful. If it is, do mention that in the comments. Give it a thumbs up. Subscribe. I will do a similar one for my uh, Fiat 500 Abarth that's parked next to me. Uh, if there is interest, I'm happy to do that for that as well. And then in a short time when the Volkswagen GTI, 2022 Volkswagen GTI Autobahn comes in, uh, I'll post some reviews of that as well. So thanks everyone. Take care. Bye-bye.